What's going on, guys? Uh, welcome to the podcast. Uh, this is going to be an exciting one. Uh, we're going to talk all about weighted balls today. So for people that uh, maybe have a lot of experience going through weighted ball programs, or maybe this is a parent of like a 14-year-old kid who just has a lot of questions and they've seen a lot of conflicting information, hopefully we can shed some light on those things. Uh, for me, this is kind of just an initial disclaimer. Like we're approaching this from the performance coaching lens. We're trying to mitigate uh, unnecessary injury risk. We're also trying to maximize performance of these guys. So players are coming to us trying to figure out how to get to the next level. It's a high school kid trying to figure out how to play at the D1 college level, college guy trying to figure out how to get drafted, a pro guy trying to figure out how to debut in the, at the big league level or how to be a big league all-star. So first and foremost, for us, that's kind of like the pinnacle of, of the pyramid. That's the lens we're looking at this through, knowing that if guys are just getting hurt all the time, then we're not helping them get to their goals. But at the same time, we're also not interested in this idea of like, if you want to just never have any risk of injury whatsoever, like just stay home, don't play competitive sports. Like there's going to be some level of injury risk, but we can 100% mitigate the injury risk from being unnecessary. And it's not like there's just guys injured all, all over the place all the time. But just keeping that in mind that whatever source that you read online, if you're looking at it from like a physical therapist standpoint, like any injury, for some of them it was like unacceptable and everything is through the lens of like complete zero percent injury risk but at the same time like no one wants to just throw 75 miles an hour 82 miles an hour and just like not have a college career not have a pro career and so just keep in mind the perspective and the lens through which the sources of information that you're reading about this stuff are talking if you're looking at it from you know a surgeons or orthos standpoint pt standpoint performance coaches standpoint you're kind of going to get a little bit of a different lens and then it's up to you to kind of come up to, with your you know risk appetite, so to speak. And we'll talk about that in significantly more depth, but where do you fall on that spectrum? So I'll introduce you guys first, Paul Hall, Leif Strom, Chase Cunningham. You guys have all thrown, you know, mid nineties plus, Leif, you've thrown upper nineties. Um, so again, we have quite a bit of experience, injuries, weighted balls, not using weighted balls, all, you know, all sorts of, all across the spectrum. So um, first off, I'd like to just kind of go through and give your background on when you got into using weighted balls and what your initial experience was. So Paul, if you want to start, when did you start using weighted balls? Thoughts on them, just generally speaking in your own career? Yeah, so I started using them actually my freshman year, um, kind of after an injury was diagnosed. So I was starting to deal with anterior shoulder pain and I was diagnosed with um, a slap tear. Um, stemming really from like the top to about the middle of my shoulder and i was noticing that i was using even plyos with the physical therapy that i was doing and i would say that around that time my freshman year was when a lot of the weighted ball prescriptions were starting to come out um, and I, when i'd returned from injury i wasn't quite the same um, in terms of not only velocity profile but feel um, and so the way that i looked at picking up plyos was to address really what was going on mechanically within that injury. So I had a really bad arm swing to like elbow hike up in a position. So really just using those as a way to fix my patterning and sequencing. I started to notice I was recovering at a better clip because of better sequencing. And I think just like the velocity came back as a byproduct of not only training, but cleaning up those patterns within um, the weighted balls. And then as I got older, started to toy and tinker around with more was when I started to use it more on the velocity output side. I did notice too when I was in a reliever role that I could use that to not only say I threw one day and then came back the next day, being able to get back to that optimal form to get on the field and still have the same output as I did the day prior. I think that's such an important point is that you can use weighted balls or plyos, which we can talk about the difference in a second, but like you can use them for maximum output you can also use them for a patterning focus and from a patterning focus standpoint you're actually trying to mitigate injury risk from that standpoint because you know if you're a guy with a low elbow poor arm action timing your elbow is way outside 90 degrees like there's something that's causing your arm to take up more stress and you're having discomfort as a direct result of that then actually using the weighted ball drills the different constraints like as a patterning focus can help mitigate injury risk and not to mention like you you alluded to that as well like most physical therapists actually already use weighted balls, if you think about it, like at the tail end of any sort of rehab, before they, you get into the actual throwing program, what are you doing? You're doing one pound, two pound, you know, rebounder throws, internal rotation throws into a mini trampoline. And so in that context, it's like everyone kind of agrees it's fine. In tossing a football in the backyard when you're seven years old, everyone agrees it's fine. It's really when talking about like the high output, maximum effort, you know, grunting, pull downs, falling on your face, like that sort of thing, that's kind of like the controversial side of things so i think initially just piecing apart like 
there's really two different ways to, to use the plyos, the weighted balls, and it doesn't have to be this only looked at as a max output thing. Leif, what about you? Yeah, so I just happened to move to Puyallup, Washington. Went to Puyallup High School my junior going to senior year. That happened to be where Driveline had their facilities. Um, at the time, I couldn't make it to Driveline, but got my TAP Sports weighted ball set and kind of started making my own prescriptions at the time. This was a pure like velocity focus for you. You were trying to figure out how to play in college. Yeah, yeah. So at this point, it was mainly about building velocity and very new to the subject as most people were. This would have been 2014. So a lot of it was just throwing the implements as a stimulus, uh, just, just throwing it. I knew that, you know, in my little league days, I always felt better after playing wall ball, wall ball, I threw with tennis ball. And so I, I tended to gravitate more towards the lighter plow balls. And that's how I spent my off seasons going into my senior year of high school and then eventually freshman, sophomore year of junior college. And was that something that, you know, was where a lot of that velocity gain initially came from? Or what, what was your experience actually going through? Again, it doesn't sound like you had a ton of structure. You yeah. were kind of just like buying the balls, ripping them as hard as you could. Yeah. Kind of like the classic, you know, why there's a stigma in the first place. People see colored balls, they immediately associate pull downs. They don't really have a program. They just go after it. But what was your experience with that? Yeah, so at first it just, it was about volume. I'd, I'd always long toss, time of long toss for me meant my arm was getting stronger when I was younger, you know, like 12, 13, 14 years old. And so volume, um, writing out a prescription and then eventually trying to make my own drills that I thought would benefit me. I always tell people like with my huge velocity gain that I had from 17 to 19, a lot of that too was, you know, weight room development. I put on a lot of size. At the same time though, I did start throwing a lot of volume in plow balls um, and ended up shooting up 15 or 60 miles an hour within that year and a half, two years. And for you, that was what, like upper 70s, low 80s to mid 90s, somewhere in that range? Yeah, so 17 is around 80, 82, maybe touching the 83. And then after senior year, it got up to low 90s. And then eventually at 18, it was 97. I think that's another kind of point that you bring up is that a lot of people think of weighted balls as like this quick fix crutch thing. I mean, that's probably the, the biggest misconception, which we can get into but realizing like it's as far as what we do here it's like a very small percentage of what goes into like an overall velocity transformation like you mentioned the weight room like that probably had a large part to play in that process like just being able to output more force like more muscle hypertrophy more strength so realizing like there's a lot of different avenues that we can tap into to gain velocity whether it's just from general you know coaching guys educating them on sequen sequencing uh, patterning like we can get a lot of the similar benefits from just using five ounce balls but at the same time, there's still some unique traits and properties that we can get from varying those ball weights as well. But for people listening to this, just recognizing like you think like you ha you're throwing 80 and you're like, I want to throw 95 next season. Well, some six week like colored ball pull down program is not going to get you there. And that's that's where you start to have these like massive injury risk trade offs when you just dive into a progression or dive into something without really any idea what you're doing without coach without addressing these other variables as well, without addressing your mechanics, without addressing the weight room, your lifting form, any sort of like scapular strength, rotator cuff strength. So just recognizing like there's a lot of things behind the scenes that go into it outside of just like what you see on social media, like pulling down six, five, four ounce balls. Chase, what was your experience? Um, before we hit on that, I wanted to mention like what you said about you need supervision when you're doing these things. Like I was in 2015, 2016 with like only thing I'd had during that time, which is like, a misconception of like what these balls were doing. So I mean, I'll never forget when I came out of college, um, just like huge velocity fluctuations through college. And I was like, all right, I got to figure out a way to like play professionally. Uh, I mean, I went on like not even the weighted ball scheme of that one, it was just the holds. And like, I was blowing up my shoulder like every day, like ripping these, I think it was two ounces and I think after one or two pounds and just doing the holds and ripping. And at first I was like, you see like a little peak, like at the beginning. And then by the end, like going into season, I was like, dude, my arm is already taxed. And I haven't even gotten into season. So like, I didn't actually, find like the way to buy what the actual structure was till probably my second second off season going like playing um and the one thing that you realize is I, mean, I think it's because i was more mature at that age i was 23 24 probably to where i understood that there's going to be an extended on-ramp to throw these balls at high effort because i knew that at that point like i said like freshman sophomore up to 94 and then by the time i was a senior i was 87 i think and just like saying a lot of other issues but 
giving yourself a proper ramp up of like not just pretend like the genetic like or generic like four week ramp up is like six to eight weeks and then in reality then i sold out for like pull downs for a 10 to 12 week cycle of like understanding like what my principles were behind it but like it wasn't until i actually had a base understanding of what was going on and why i was using them that i could actually get some benefit from them like beforehand i was just tossing the thumb as hard as i could and hoping that that would give me the trick because i was like oh my arms in shape i've been throwing um, but then finally taking a step back and realizing like dude like my shoulder can't handle this like once the ramp up happened and i found the volume like you said at the beginning like my arm never hurt like i could throw like i i can say this like in my career never missed a start even with some like struggles but like my shoulder was always pretty good i always felt like i could sustain what i was finding in the off season because like i think there was so much structure but a lot of people like you said they go into the see social media of let's rip these pull downs let's do even like mound videos, whatever, but it's like, there's a prerequisite to all this, whether it be strength-based, whether it be like, just like age in general, like you have to have these prerequisites before you can actually like, if you're chasing the velocity side, like find the velocity from that, you know what I mean? So, I mean, it was an interesting cycle for me going through pull downs, cause, or like going through weighted balls in general, because it's been very much of a high output, all right, understand it, get back to high output, because I knew that was important for me. And then it's like, okay, now like, let's use it more as a patterning, um, like getting a feel, because now, I unlocked the ability to have intent. And I also thought it was very valuable like when we did pull downs or did any type of weighted baseball training that like, I saw a number, especially going under load, that was a lot higher than what I'd done previously. It wasn't the fact that I thought of like, oh, I can hit that number eventually. It was the fact that, like, I saw that number out there and my arm was completely fine. I was like, oh, like, I shouldn't be that stressed about when I go into, into games and I'm four or five miles below what my peak are, right? It's like my body has been accustomed to it now it should be able to withstand. I think that just like underlying confidence on the backside. I think there is some truth to that, to let guys like let it go when they get into competitive season. Yeah, certainly from, from a output standpoint, from like looking at it from that perspective, when guys can get up to a handful, you know, three, four, five miles an hour above what they've ever done on the mound, there is that kind of confidence that their arm is gonna be able to withstand that and hold up to it. Like, let's, let's not pretend that we're not gonna be throwing max effort in season. And maybe some coaches will say like don't throw a max effort in a game ever but like you're going to be throwing game effort in games and so at, at some point we do need to prepare for the intensity you're going to be throwing in, in games but again it's about the dosage it's about on ramping properly and that's where 95 percent of the people that use weighted balls without a program go wrong is they just think like oh, i can just throw these things no plan no on ramp just follow something i see online and like it's all going to work out and that's and then a number of those guys end up getting injured then they end up going to you know PT clinics, and now all, all these PTs think that weighted balls are like the worst thing ever, and it's it's really just coming back to like how do you use the tool? Paul and I are talking right right before this about this idea of like lifting weights was seen as like this this huge like no no like you're gonna you're gonna get injured like for baseball specifically like 20 30 years ago, it's become a lot more mainstream, but you think about like can you get injured in the weight room? Absolutely. What if we just said like lifting is bad, like squatting is bad, like can you get injured squatting? Absolutely. Are you going to go squat every single day? You're going to max out every day. You're going to have bad form, knees caving in, back rounding. Like you're almost certainly going to get injured at some point if you do that. The only way to guarantee you're never going to have any injury whatsoever, like just don't ever go in the weight room. But at that point, now you're going to go into a game throwing max effort. You've never gone into the weight room. You've never prepared your bodies, your tissues, et cetera. And so it's a really about the nuance behind what we're doing and having a purpose behind what we're doing. You know, if you go in the weight room and you have a program, it's periodized, you're squatting once or twice a week, the volume's right, you have a coach there monitoring your form, like the injury risk is exceptionally low. And so it's really just a tool and it's how you actually use the tool. But I do wanna to touch on the, the intent thing that you brought up. You hear like the buzzword intent, 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 like and I certainly heard this coming up because I mean, we're roughly the same age. So I was doing this similar type program in college of what you described. But even before that, you hear all this stuff about like intent, where my take on that is, there is to some extent like your body will organize itself to achieve the goal if you're trying to throw hard your body's going to try to organize, organize itself to achieve that goal but at the same time you can take that to too much of an extreme where now every single day of the week you think you're not getting anything out of that throw unless it's max effort and so what most guys will fall into is okay they have one or two days a week where they're high output days they ramp up okay cool i'm going to do these two high output days and i'm going to have maybe two moderate effort days and those moderate effort days turn into like 90% days. And they have a couple recovery days in there. And those recovery days turn into like 75, 80% days. And the thought is these guys mistakenly take this intent mindset of like, I'm not getting anything out of this throw unless I'm grunting, unless there's a ton of arm speed, unless there's a ton of intent. And what we've all seen and know as coaches and been going through this ourselves is like, you just burn yourself out so fast if you do that. You can still get 
you can absolutely get something out of a recovery day by just taking your arm for a walk. This idea of like the Billy Wagner, like throw hard easy, like how far out can I get and catch play with barely feeling like I'm using my arm? How much harder can I throw this next throw with as little effort as possible? And so realizing like it's really about efficiency, it's about sequencing, it's about like how easily can I throw at these velocities at lower effort ranges? Because you're just gonna burn yourself out if every single day becomes like 10, 20, 30% higher effort than it really should be. So maybe any of you guys can speak to that. Have you seen that tendency? And then what do you do when one of your athletes is falling into that trap? Yeah, so I've seen it on both spectrums, I guess, from the going way too hard, way too often part, I can speak to it from my own experience. And like during that time when I was gaining a lot of velocity, going way too hard, I didn't even consider what arm injuries even were. You know, I was a guy who my arm never, ever hurt, ever. And so it's just rip, rip, rip all the time. And then, you know, eventually a lot of guys that you talk to the same story, it's like rubber arm, rubber arm. And then maybe 2021, 20, you have an injury, then all of a sudden another injury, another injury. And a lot of that's compounding from those years of, you know, pushing the boundaries of what you should have been throwing day after day after day. And, uh, you know, to go back and look at that, maybe you made some big gains, but then you set yourself up for an important part of your career where you are dealing with stuff now, like a lot of, a lot of shoulder things, a lot of, a lot of things that are more chronic um, that you build up during you know, the younger years of your career. Those are important. And then from the other side of things, like you said, learning the pattern on those off days, on those low intent days, that's what really, I would say, prolonged my career in general. And I see a lot of the best guys in here who stay around the game for a long time, throw hard for a long time, really utilize those days to put work into patterns so that they can throw harder, more efficiently, stay healthy for longer. Intent almost becomes this crutch of like, they think that just like, I used, this was my own story in college or in you know, freshman year of college. And I was actually the slowest thrower on the team. I was, you know, mid eighties lefty walk on, on on this D1 ACC school. And I'm the guy that's like first throw and catch play. I'm like blowing up my partner. And I'm just like thinking like the only way I'm gonna throw harder is like to try to throw hard. I've been told like, I need to just try to throw hard every single day. And so I'm just blowing guys up and I'm just, my arm is just gassed like three weeks in the first fall, just like trying to impress everybody like every single day and thinking like, I'm not getting any, I gotta get everything out of every throw every day. Like for me, it wasn't like a work ethic problem. It was just like, I didn't understand that you actually need the undulation and intensity and that intent is not like the end all be all. You need some some periods of the off season where like you are absolutely pushing output and you've responsibly built up to that. But for me, I would end up just like letting my arm action take over the throw. And I actually wasn't, I was ignoring proper sequencing. Like I needed to learn how to actually like load my back backside, sequence my lower half to my trunk, to my upper half. But instead what I was doing is I was just like using that as a crutch and just like muscling up all arm. And so realizing like those lighter days can absolutely be like, let's figure out how to actually sequence our body properly. The high up a days is like, how do you actually tie all this sequencing together and do that with, you know, high, high force, high velocity. I, I really like to allude it to like a hitter, for instance, is, you know, as pitchers and throwers, we can't throw 200 baseballs and then come back and do it again. Like the hitting aspect you can. And I think a lot of issues specifically from a younger age, it's like, when do we time up high output, right? It's like, we can't throw a high output every day despite my arm actually feeling as good for the long-term effects of that. And I think it's really about establishing the objectives within each day. If we can change it from, oh, it's just a recovery day. It's like, all right, well, my arm feels good. Why can't I just, you know, rip it on that in a sense? It's like, okay, within your recovery day, you're gonna have a patterning emphasis on this. You're gonna have a constraint throwing catch play session to work on X, Y, and Z. Your high output day either has a focus. So let's just say you have a bullpen, you have a plyo testing day, or you have a pull down day, sort of illustrating when you want to save your high output throws and labeling those days in between with a certain objective in mind. And I think that that can really hone in a guy to attack um, their, their plan, their, their emphasis for that day and controlling the output the way that you need on top of radar feedback can obviously help with that. By giving them a specific purpose and understanding what they're actually trying to achieve as yeah. opposed to just like ignoring everything and just like blind intent, no purpose, just like completely bypassing all of that. Yeah. Give them a specific focus, pitch shape, you know, arm action emphasis, patterning emphasis, command emphasis, something, something so they actually like know what they're working on each throw as opposed to just defaulting to, you know, caveman throwing 
mentality. And I think that's where I kind of messed up at high school. But I would say I was probably really similar is, you know, I got hurt um, significantly before I even picked up a weighted ball, like a plyo ball, a weighted leather ball. And, you know, one, I think I threw too hard for what my body could handle, not touching a weight till senior year, you know, being able to get up to 92 as a senior in high school at a buck 50. Um, and I think the issue was is that I would always long toss like crazy and want to throw the crap out of it coming in. So just like not having an understanding of the days in between, I think was a, was a big predicator to that down the line. So let's touch real quick on the difference between like weighted balls, plyos, they're kind of used synonymously, but like obviously they're, they're different things. I know when I like first heard about all this stuff, like I didn't know the difference. I was like, what do, what's, what's plyo versus, I thought plyo, I'm like plyometrics, like lower body, like jumps, plyos. Um, but maybe like just show the difference between, for, especially for like parents who aren't familiar. Um, why would we throw plyos? Why would we, th we throw hard weighted balls? Like what's, what's the main thought process between why we would do, like why do we even need plyos in the first place? Why not just throw hard weighted balls? I mean, for me, and I wanna hit on one thing before then is like, like you said, the buzzword of intent too. Like I think you can spread that out just a little bit to have it to where every day has intention. Right, so it's like intent drives just high output, intention drives what you're trying to accomplish for that day. And I just think like people just like to use intent as just this really big buzzword, but I think if you could just spread out a little bit, you can get a lot more out of it. Um, but as far as like the plyos compared to weighted baseballs, um, I think like me personally, um, when I was getting into the same idea, like this gave me, the plyos specifically gave me the feel of not a baseball. I was domed up about the feeling of a baseball in my hand, trying to fix mechanics giving myself a different implement. And in reality, like being able to actually warm up with something other than the baseball was just like a tremendous unlock for me, especially like I didn't like, obviously at first we did go like pretty heavy, but as we kind of regressed into like what the normal weight should be, um, just like that feeling every day of using those types, like and kind of comboing them depending on the day, it was like, it gave me such a better feel. Like when I'm getting my throwing, my baseball feels so much better compared to all those. Just like in reality, I watch throwing that gets done on a daily basis where you hit some bands and all of a sudden you start doing your wrist flicks, whatever. That's like, we know it's not doing anything for us, you know? Um, so like that was like my big thing was just like, it gave me such freedom to actually start to tinker with mechanics, feel some of this stuff out um, without, like I said, just immediately going in my own way and like doming myself up about it. Yeah, I mean, one, obviously one of the main benefits is you can throw it into a net or a wall, like specifically a wall, like you can't do with the hard balls, so you can do it kind of on your own time. And for me, it's, you know, the ability to get away from needing to throw to a partner. So you kind of, you've like removed the focus from more external, like having to hit a specific target to like, I can really focus on something a little bit more like internal or specific to my patterns. Now, obviously there's risks to that, which we can talk more about in a different podcast. You don't want to get like too stuck in your own, like in your own head and internally focused, but from a warm up standpoint, it absolutely lets you get away from, you know, having to throw a baseball to a target, lets you just like work on the action of, hey, my arm action sequencing or my lower half patterns or being able to focus on something. Now you can take it to more of an external focus once you get into your catch play for the day. That being said, I mean, there's definitely some common flaws or like risks we'll see with the plyos again, because they're so like they're so squishy i know one i can bring up off the top of my head is guys will some guys will just like white knuckle it and they'll just like find themselves naturally just like squeezing it way harder than they would grip a baseball what do you guys do when you see that is that something you just try to cue cue them out of or will you just say like no plyos altogether yeah i think in general a lot of times when you see guys like that it's stemming from a larger issue from their throwing in general um, and then that's going to be something that you know, systematically you probably implement different cues or different drills to get them into that more of a relaxed feeling and plows can always just enhance that thing that you're seeing. Um, so for those guys, a lot of times you're just working through very flowy things, trying to get them to understand that, you know, we're not tight movers until a certain point. Um, and even with those guys that maybe are extremely tight movers, like letting them relax, let the ball take them into the positions that it's meant to take them in and use it for the patterning purpose that we are, especially like we said in those low intent days. Are you guys a fan of the different balls now that have seams on them? I know Chase, you mentioned like having something that was actually relatively different from a baseball was helpful for you because it got you out of that mentality of like, I don't know if it was the feel of the seams in your hand or like overthinking it. Um, would you have preferred using a ball with seams at that point, or do you actually like there were no it's, seams? It's funny you mentioned that because I would say through, 
honestly, up until probably a year and a half ago, I was sold out on like no seams. Like it gave me such a good feel, like I said, something different. And then just like anything else that you just do all the time, you get a feel for it, all of a sudden like it starts to become a hamper. I can feel myself starting to like just nonchalantly stay in supination too long, like doing other stuff that I would never used to do. And then like same idea, like once you recognize it, just don't kind of stay in the rut. We have other options available. So then when I went to like the lace balls, like that gave me back, I was like, okay. And it also gave me a little bit more of like a different feel again, cause I was just so used to these sand balls, no seams, and going that kind of gave me back more. But at first it was like night and day difference of like plyos. Like my plyo throwing at first was tremendously better than um, my baseball just because I think I got out of my own way and then obviously just kind of systematically got it back to where it needed to be. Other reasons you guys would, uh, you know, use plyos versus weighted balls or maybe get away from plyos in some cases and just focus on weighted balls. Like how do you guys think through the differences between the two and the applications? Just speaking from someone in the building, Declan Cronin, he moved away from plow balls into the leathers. Um, and I know that's something for him was a feel thing, but also just the stimulus that the plow balls were giving him versus what the leather weighteds were able to do for him. Um, I recently just in throwing, you know, after I've retired from baseball, I have recently moved to just leathers um, just because in general for me, it gives me a better feel going into my catch play. I find that a lot of my guys who maybe are a little less feel based, a little more sporadic, um, making that switch to the leathers to start their plyo drills, to start their catch play is going to help them just because they are going to need baseball feel in their hand as much as we can get it because they have issues with throwing the baseball. And very different to the point that Chase brought up about, you know, finding finding that stimulus that makes you feel good going into the baseball throws um, where I know he had command of the ball when he wanted. I'm more so talking to the point of the guys who they get to the baseball in their hand and it feels foreign and they really gravitate towards plow balls. And those are the guys that I tend to implement the leather weighted in because I'm trying to get as much baseball feel as I can for them going into their outings, going into their season. I think I can uh, even think of instances on like a, another end from like a psychological standpoint too, is like if I notice like a guy is patterning significantly better with plyos versus a baseball than like giving them the same feel with a leather ball and trying to see if that works. I've seen uh, work tenfold for those guys knowing that like, hey, I can repeat the same sequencing from like my plyos with a leather baseball into my catch play and further. I think um, to even your other point that you made about the muscling up and like tensing up piece, uh, I think that's a good way to bridge the gap with that feel. Um, and then two is I've seen repetitive guys get really pushy with the plyos and then like giving them the baseball feel like cleaned it up a little bit, felt something more natural to them. Like are weighted balls necessary in every case to gain velocity or do you guys have, issues, have scenarios where like for certain guys, we're not using plyos, we're not using weighted balls of any kind, or they're just like, hey, I'm not comfortable with weighted balls for whatever reason. Like, how do you approach that overall training process when you have a guy who maybe isn't comfortable with weighted balls, or are there scenarios where you try it and then for whatever reason you scrap it? And what, what are those scenarios where you might just be like, we're gonna throw five ounce stuff and that's it? Multifaceted, but I think depending upon the level of the athlete I think does matter a lot. Um, we just take, for example, like a big guy that's never used them. Um, if nothing's going wrong and like, there's not that much like to quote unquote fix, like maybe adding in that implement might not be the best thing, especially if there hasn't been much of injury risk. But for younger college, like even like us, whatever, if there's something going on that like, you know that you need to like, eh, maybe it is game velocity or just clean up something. I think giving them an understanding of like, what is the purpose behind doing these? Like, why are we actually going to implement them? That's when it goes into the mentality of like, okay, this is more of just like, hey, a warm up tool, a patterning tool to actually have some good reps before you ever get into throwing. And it can never be more than 60 or 70%. It just they could do one or two drills, boom, a freaking uh, flow of energy throw. And it's like, all right, let's get into throwing. Uh, but I think finding out for each athlete like, what works the best, but I definitely think most guys could see some sort of benefit in them being used. It's just like how necessarily you're going to use them, I think, is where like the bread and butter is. Right. It's it's more like, are we going to be ultra, ultra conservative, just use a, a warm up patterning standpoint, or are we going to kind of push the envelope a little bit and do more of the high output stuff? Um, could, could we maybe go over briefly, like, what is 
what is the purpose of like, from a patterning standpoint, why would this work better than just a five ounce ball? Like, why can't we just throw a five ounce plyo into a net? What's the purpose of having like seven ounce throws, like three ounce throws, one pound plyo ball throws? Like, why would this even help more than just throwing a five ounce ball from different drills in the first place? I think that in general, bouncing off that point into this question, it's like a lot of times, you know, a parent or a kid is asking why they should be doing plyo balls in general. And then, you know, be very willing to go in the backyard and throw a football or they'll watch their kid play wall ball with a tennis ball for an hour after a little league game. And, you know, it's 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 not hurting anybody because I think weighted ball is not associated with those two things. Um, and then also like skipping rocks, like variability in arm action, things like that. Um, a lot of times you look at shortstops, best throwers on the field, lots of variability in the arm action. And then to your point on why use plyos, I look kind of like for a, for a weight room thing here where if you're training for a lift, right, you're gonna focus on those weak points in your lift, whether that be maybe like a pin press or something where you're doing quarter reps or something to work on the part where you're weakest at in that exercise, in that pattern. Same thing with weighted balls where a lot of times you're gonna use the heavy to light implements to work on that spot in the throw where you are weakest at. And then that eventually can become a crutch like Chase said, like I'm sure we've all had experience with where you maybe stay in a pattern that helped you for, you know, two, two and a half, three years. Eventually that becomes your crutch and now, you know, you pivot. Um, and that's where, you know, the art of coaching, the art of, you know, knowing yourself as an athlete, understanding where that weakness is and, and what, what stimulus you're using to attack that certain weakness within the arm. But it's, it's no different than anything else, you know, sprinters, throwers, weightlifters attacking your weakness, weaknesses with either constraints or a different stimulus. One thing that I've, uh, I've kind of talked about for a while is this idea of like added feedback or proprioception from heavier balls. It's something like this, when I very first started experimenting and, and playing with some of this stuff in, in high school, but more specifically in college, realizing like, especially with like with a one or two pound ball, like you have so much more uh, proprioceptive feedback of where your arm is in space like it's just very it's very obvious as you're throwing like where your hand is where your arm is in space like you can feel it significantly more and you you take the opposite end like I'm gonna throw a wiffle ball like I have no idea what, what, my, what my arm's doing because there's no there's nothing like there's really no mass in my hand like giving me any feedback about where it is in space like I, I'll give guys the analogy of if we're gonna go do a deadlift and we just have the bar like no weight well, you can like you can get that bar up like a million different ways. You can round your back. You can go super inefficient. You can stagger your stance. You can be off offset. But you put four or five on the bar. Like you better get in good positions. Like you're gonna you're gonna be hyper aware of like if your back rounds. Like you're gonna be hyper aware of any inefficiency in the movement. So with with a slightly heavier ball, now you start to feel the positions a lot better. There's more. There's like louder proprioceptive feedback. It's one reason with like a football. And for example, there's other constraints related to that. But like. You're not going to see guys like with these crazy like long like hooking arm actions like super late like the football people you just imagine guys throwing a football like you don't see as any, anywhere near as crazy of the things as you might see with baseball throwing part of that is the size of the implement the shape of the implement part of it is the weight of the implement it actually forces a little bit more of like a constrained arm path another thing with that outside of just like the enhanced proprioception and i'm not saying a football arm action is like the perfect arm action but realizing like the weight will kind of constrain the, the patterns available to you. The heavier balls tend to encourage the hand to get closer to the axis of rotation. So we have a guy who's really low elbow, dragging his arm, like just getting in really bad positions, like the arm's way out of plane. We know that's an injury risk. We also know that's a performance you know, decreaser. So from a velocity standpoint and from an injury mitigation standpoint, like we gotta get that arm in plane to some extent. We can use the heavy balls to give them louder proprioceptive feedback of where their arm is in space. So now they're hyper aware of what their arm's doing in terms of like they can feel what we're trying to get them to do better. But then also now that ball starts to come in closer to the axis of rotation, not necessarily like here, but if a guy's dragging, we can start to creep them back more towards a, a neutral 90 degree elbow flexion position, a little bit closer towards that, you know, shoulder or elbow in line with the shoulder, 90 degrees of abduction position. So that's something where the heavier balls, we can almost be, without even really needing to cue them a ton, it starts to make some of these subtle alterations for you. You can take that to too far of an extreme and now you're having guys do like four pound pivot pickoffs or like pivot pickoffs with like wrist weights. And like at some level, if the ball gets too heavy, guys lose the ability to actually relax into layback and just allow their arm to whip. So it can definitely be taken too far to that extreme as well. What would you say 
to that and then also to the opposite end like with the lighter balls like what what types of patterns are the lighter balls like subtly encouraging if you'd have a guy do that or when would you apply more of like a lighter ball emphasis from a patterning standpoint i i think the simple answer can be you know you just don't have very fast arm speed you're late kind of you're a late arm action guy um, and i think feeding off of your point you know very much how when i picked it up it came from like injuries like when i started this process and that was tenfold like what i noticed with the heavier balls is like i actually got awareness of okay this pattern hurts like crazy what if i tinkered around with more linear path and i'm like oh that actually synced up felt better and then that's sort of where i got that i think it's where the exploration process happens like you want to welcome these these bad reps if you will so there now becomes an awareness of okay what happens when i do that and then how do i problem solve and that's where i think the guidance comes in from a coach you know, someone who has experience using them and the patterning and sequencing is, that way you have the correction, the feedback, what it's supposed to be as it's tailored towards you. Yeah. You drag your arm with a two pound ball, it feels terrible. Yeah. And then like one rep later, you don't drag your arm because you just like felt what that feels like with two pounds now dragging on your arm versus you do that with a wiffle ball, or you do it with a two ounce ball. Like you can throw that improperly, quote unquote, in like a bunch of different ways. Yeah. But there's such like louder feedback on what your arm's doing in space that like you're like, oh, don't do that again. Like I better get my arm in plane. And the arm naturally wants to find that slot a little bit better. Again, within reason, you go like 20 times the weight of a baseball. Now it starts to get like too far removed from the actual skill of throwing a five ounce baseball. Another common mistake, um, you know, I'll bring up that we see all the time is like cutting plow balls. So I know we're, we're starting to get more into like the nitty gritty of like, when guys are actually doing these programs, what are, what are some of the issues? But um, one of the main things we see, you, you might see is guys start doing a plyo ball or weighted ball program, and then they go into catch play and like everything's cutting. So one of the things I make sure to warn my guys about is when you're throwing a plyo ball into a wall, again, because now we're gonna be typically so much closer to that target, so much closer to the wall, there's typically this, this natural instinct to like throw the ball and hit like directly in front of your face, directly in the center of the, of the target and in the center of the wall. But because you're so close, what most guys end up doing is now their elbow starts to push forward and they start to guide or, or kind of yank the ball to the center line, as opposed to allowing their arm to spiral out and around and hit the ball, hit the wall somewhere arm side of the center line. And so just for anybody who's gonna start going and doing plyos or probably a lot of people watching this are already doing some sort of plyo routine. That's a huge, huge, huge like, I would say half the guys that start doing them are making that mistake early on. And you just have to make them aware of like, hey, that ball should be hitting the wall somewhere arm side of the center line. If you're hitting the center line from five feet away, that means you're just yanking the ball in front, driving forward with the elbow. And that's typically the guys where they go out and catch play, the ball's cutting, they start feeling like some tricep discomfort or soreness because now their tricep becomes the main accelerator of the arm. Other common mistakes that you guys see when doing weighted ball programs, when doing plyos, like what are some other issues that you guys see? Yeah, so I think that um, kind of tying this into the last subject too is that heavy ball fixes everything. Like a lot of times weighted ball, you know, that's going to be most people are going to associate that with something that's heavier than baseball just because they're thinking weighted, okay, more weight. Um, and speaking to the point of, you know, lighter implements and stuff, like when is that happening? A lot of times with the pushier guys that I have, it will be, okay, we're going to get into something that brings you up to a baseball weight. I know I've talked about the open hand progression before, but you know, starting with the natural feel there and then working up three ounce, four ounce, five ounce into what eventually is gonna be their most natural slot, they're feeling good. A lot of times that's gonna be either guys that are just naturally somehow developed to push the action or guys that, like I said, have been overload, overload, overload their, their whole life. Um, but you know, that's the misconception that I see a lot is that weighted balls are extra weight when you know when you get the set you're getting the full set overload to underload so knowing how to implement all of those is very important when you're first starting. How do you know what weights to use like let's say a, a parent buys a plyo care ball set for his 15 year old kid 14 year old kid um, like should they throw a two pound ball a four pound ball a one pound ball like at what point do you know if like this ball is too heavy or this ball is too light and it's negatively altering something in their mechanics. Yeah, I think in general, it's gonna be what structures are at play. You know, like whether you love them or hate them, uh, reverse throws, like I've never seen anybody do a reverse throw with a great ball. You know, 
a lot of times we're we're relying on structures that are stronger and so we can grab that black green the pink ball whatever weight we want to implement to get into that throw and then as we move into different constraints you know the more constrained you are usually the more you can get away with heavier implements but as you become less and less constrained that implement coming down in weight and then eventually like we talked about before what's the pattern you're attacking and what part in the throw are you trying to change or trying to repattern? And that's when you can start implementing the different weights from a parent perspective of when you should implement just heavy to light ball. I think that education in general for you, like seeking help to understand, okay, this is what my son at this age, at this skill level needs to be doing. And this is why he's doing it. Because a common mistake, like you said, is ordering a set from Amazon, unwrapping it, and then going making 100 throws before your catch play session and calling it a low effort day because you made 20 baseball throws. Um, so, you know, seeking guidance is the first thing I would say if, if, you, if you don't have a lot of experience or don't really know what weighted balls do for your arm. Yeah, I think, that, again, we, can, we can't rehash this at that point too, too much is no matter what you do, don't just immediately go and buy a set of ply balls and just like start trying to implement them yourself. Like you can do that, but three, four, five years later and a number of injuries later, like you'll realize and wish that you had just like gone and sought advice from someone who had done this before. Again, it doesn't have to be us in any capacity, but like just some sort of guidance in terms of what you're doing. And again, looking at the bigger picture of, okay, am I just like, like really trying to separate yourself from this? Am I just trying to use this as a crutch or quick fix? Do I actually have these other aspects of my overall programming in line? Do I have something that I'm really bought in on from the weight room side, the strength side, the arm care side, from the mechanic side, like have I have I truly like tapped into these other avenues before I'm just like trying to zoom in and make this like 75% of what I'm doing. If this isn't going to be like 5% of what you're doing, then you need to just take a step back and education needs to become your primary focus to start versus just like jumping head over heels into like, I got to do this stuff because, you know, I see Joe Schmo kid on like the other varsity team doing it. So I, I think your point, like education is definitely the most important thing until you like really have some comfort and awareness with the overall progression of what you're trying to do. So how exactly does remote coaching work? You will have unlimited access to text and email your coach, hop on weekly FaceTime calls and receive regular mechanical and training updates. Each day, your plan will detail exactly what to do from start to finish with instructional videos for every single throwing drill, mobility routine and lifting exercise. Nobody's going to do the work for you, but we can show you the path to get there. It's your career. Let's get to work. What do you guys think as far as counting like ply with rows tor towards like overall throwing volume? Because you'll you'll have guys where they're like, oh, I only did like, I only threw to 60 feet today or whatever for 20 throws. How do you kind of monitor the workload from the plyo standpoint? Do that, does that still count as throwing for the day? How do you, how do you kind of keep track of that and monitor those things? So um, for me with the plyos, like, I have, like with all my athletes, I like to lay it out for them immediately. Of, like this does count, especially for the young guys. Usually older guys have some sort of feel for that. Um, but the younger guys, they'll like, if you look at a normal structure, let's say they're fully ramped up, they've gone through everything. They're probably doing upwards of, let's just say 50 or 60, right? And it's like, you probably want to stay roughly in that 100 to 130 kind of window in a throwing session, ran, like typically. Um, so it's like, okay, now I had, and I used to apply this to my training too, and I was first doing this by myself. I was like, okay, if I had these 60 throws today with plyos, okay, I am cutting myself off and I'm not doing any more than 50 throws with the baseball in my long toss. And that's when I really went away from because I used to be such big on long toss. I was like, okay, this might take me so many throws to get there. It's like, I'm getting to max distance, max whatever in 40 throws. There's no reason for me to be wasting time when I'm already in this already ready state. And um, then the other piece of it is like on those recovery days, on those patterning days, it's like, okay, if you want to, I tell you on recovery, if you want to do recovery, you have like two options. You could, let's say you have 30 or 40 as your total volume that day. You can split it up with plyos and catch play. You can do catch play, but you can just do plyos. But like, you're going to keep the volume relatively low. So at least if you are by yourself and you may be going a little bit harder, at least we know the volume is somewhat controlled and you're not just still doing a hundred plus throws. And then all of a sudden like, oh, my arm's really sore. It was like, what did you do? Oh, I did all this extra stuff. And it's like, okay, like, have some sort of education, I think always reigns supreme. And like, once you can get them to understand like why these things are happening, the reasons behind what we're doing, the structure, it usually starts to blend a lot easier, I think. But like, they just need to kind of understand what they're trying to accomplish with it, you know? 
Yeah, I think that's that's even more important if you're dealing with some sort of like rehab throwing situation, which like, believe it or not, will like definitely at times use ply placker balls or weighted balls as a patterning focus, like within a rehab progression as well. But to that point, you know, if a guy has, let's say 80 throws called for in his program, you know, you're not just gonna do the 80 throws, 80 throws and catch play in his program and then also tack on like 50 plyo throws. Like maybe, you know, maybe that's a conversation with his PT, with the athlete, with us, and we take a chunk of those, we take 20 of those 80 throws and those become like a warm up patterning focus with, instead of just a five ounce plyo, maybe there's a seven ounce plyo in there for a couple throws or one pound plyo ball for a couple throws. Uh, but just keeping in mind like these, it's still throwing, you're throwing an implement, you're applying stress to the arm even if there is a specific patterning focus and we're getting some benefit out of there, just like recognize that still counts towards the overall volume. You can't just take what you're already doing, tack on a bunch of additional work, and then assume that that workload didn't just like jump up by 20, 30, 50%. I really do think um, to blend those both points is that it's understanding the athlete situation, like a novice, you don't want to give them, you know, all aspects of the weighted balls like with a novice even if they're older and they have like strength competencies like starting them off with just a seven and a five ounce ball and keeping that volume you know at a five to eight reps with like three drills that way they're starting to build the competency and understanding that hey this is more than i've done in the past because you can throw too much at a guy before they're actually ready to handle and then using the athlete's feedback on a daily basis is if you start to notice they're like, man, I'm gassed after going into plyos. Um, you know, that's when you're looking at the volume to, hey, is your intensity just too hard within those sessions? And I think a funny point that I see sometimes is to the point of monitoring throws and like your volume from plyos to catch play is by the time you're done with plyos, you should be able to, I'm not gonna say off rip, throw 100% to your catch play partner, but you should be able to put that thing on a moderate yeah. on a on You a don't moderate need to necessarily line. start at 20 feet with like, some wrist flicks like you can you can get going at 60 feet pretty 60 feet quick easy. like take 10 throws to get your arm loose and moving and then like you can get right into it so it does save time on the back end once you actually get into your catch play or long toss like you skip the feel phase uh, and like catch play with implementing piles like you're you're not going into straight from bands your dynamic warm-up into catch play and you're like like by the time you're done with that like i'm ready to go put that thing going one thing i do want to bring up on you know, the, the heavy versus light ball, like continuum is like, which structures are typically gonna be getting stressed more on each end of that spectrum. So not really, not necessarily from a patterning standpoint, but from a, like a, where are you gonna get more sore if you do more heavy stuff or do more light stuff? Um, because I've experienced myself personally, like just kind of overdoing the volume on heavy stuff, like typically gonna get sore in your accelerators because now you're having to really like accelerate significantly more weight out of that layback position lat, Terry's major, subscap, like these are areas that are gonna be taking on a little bit more workload than just throwing a five ounce ball. But at the same time, now, if you're doing like underweight stuff, gray ball plyos or three ounce, four ounce stuff, your arm's now moving a lot faster than it would be with a five ounce baseball. So what's getting worked more? Your decelerators. So now bicep soreness, brachioradialis soreness, extensor, uh, you know, wrist extensor soreness, posterior shoulder soreness, and so just realizing like the lighter balls are gonna be a little bit more demand on your decelerators, the heavier balls are gonna be a little bit more demand on the accelerators. And just just being aware of that going into it. I just think people don't like factor that in. They think it's just like the stress is gonna be very similar in terms of where you get sore, but there are subtle differences and it just, it really does make sense to build up to these different weights slowly if you're going to do it. Whether, again, whether that's, personally, I'm more, I'm more terrified of like pulling down a three ounce ball than like throwing something overweight because I know how aggressively fast your arm is moving when you have a lighter implement in your hand. I know you're a very much underweight guy, but just recognizing like the decelerator stress is actually gonna be significantly more. So I'm, I'm shocked when I see guys like pulling down. Uh, we don't have a ton of guys do like three ounce pull downs typically here or even like two ounce terrifies me. Uh, but you'll see like videos of somebody like pulling down a two ounce ball at 120 miles an hour and just recognizing like maybe his accelerators can handle that, but like that's a lot that's a lot going on with the decelerator specifically. I'm not as much a, you know, stimulus driven underweight guy. Like I believe in the underweights as implements, especially at lower intensities, building up to the patterns that are going to show themselves in catch play. Cueing relaxation and like arm speed. Yeah, yeah. And I think that one of the common things from uh, heavy and light, just talking about some differences that 
you know, if you're new to weighted balls and you're trying to see things is, you know, going into a heavy ball and we talk about like staying in some supination, um, but the natural tendency to kind of like curl this wrist in here. Um, and you feel the bicep kind of like contract through that and then you end up doing this and then pushing through, right? Getting some more maybe tricep after your throwing sessions, things like that. And then with the light ball, tending to let that arm drift away, maybe go into some pronation, like fingers towards second base, the old, you know, V to the sky that lots of people were doing like in the 90s, early 2000s, but having that ball drift away from you and then ripping through and then having the bicep have to rapidly contract through that arm action and then, you know, understanding where you're sore after your sessions and then maybe going back looking at the video or having someone that watch you be able to say, hey, this is what this different implement's doing for you. Make sure we stay away from this or make sure we get to better patterns with both of them. So the underweight ball is really good for relaxation, arm speed, but be aware if the arm starts to drag behind you. The heavy ball is good for patterning, enhanced proprioception, but be aware if the elbow starts to climb, push forward and wrap into too much supination. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Let's talk a little bit about like the injury concerns, like safety aspect, um, because again, this is kind of like a controversial topic. Again, we, we see this every day. We've coached thousands of athletes. The injury rates are very low. We're not having guys just get injured every single day. So we're all very comfortable that like if a guy goes and warms up with you know a one pound ball or a seven ounce ball, like his arm doesn't just blow up. No more than if he goes and plays, you know, catch with a football at you know a warm up emphasis for five to 10 minutes, makes 40, 50 throws. Like we know that the guy's arms don't just blow up, but this is such a controversial topic that I think we already covered why the stigma exists in the first place. People just buy weighted ball sets. They start implementing them without a plan, without a process, without an on-ramp, without the strength training background. But what would you say about, there's this idea that weighted balls are just gonna increase like the amount of layback that we have in our shoulder. And that that's immediately going to lead to an increased injury risk as a direct result of that. Like obviously there's, it's a little bit controversial because there is conflicting research out there, some showing that, some not showing that. But what do you think about that as being like the proposed mechanism by which weighted balls work and that that must inherently lead to an increased injury risk? So, I mean, speaking from an injury risk standpoint and especially a large crowd of people that I don't wanna say are uneducated, but maybe not putting the pieces together like correlation versus causation and what's really happening within the game today and you see an influx in weighted balls or different training principles and maybe an influx in surgeries or an influx in you know injuries or something like that and maybe there is you know there's a clear line seeing an influx in injuries and influx in surgeries however there's a large influx in younger kids throwing harder major leaguers throwing harder consistently and we're not talking about top ends we're talking about across the board like the mean and median velo going up across baseball and then we're also talking about just the advancements in medicine and how routine these surgeries now are you know back in the 80s even maybe the 90s where you know you have the high school kid that threw hard 14 15 years old and then you know feels a feels a pop in his arm one day takes the season off, comes back the next year, he's down 10 miles an hour, but he's still throwing. And no one really knows. They're just like, ah, oh, Jim wasn't ever the same, you know? Whereas now we, we know what that is. The surgery's done and the kid comes back healthy with a good rehab process. And the reason those surgeries are done is because they're available. So yeah, there's an uptick in that stuff, but it's because one, more people are throwing harder because more people are seeking to throw hard. And then also there's more availability to surgeries and rehabilitation that there wasn't before so of course there's going to be some more of that in the game today i also think there's there's this idea that anything that's more more stressful than throwing off a mound must inherently be bad like stress equals bad anyone would tell you that like a running throw even like a pull down with a five ounce ball that you're throwing 100 miles an hour but you throw 95 off the mound like no one is arguing that a 100 mile an hour pull down throw is not more stressful than a 95 mile an hour throw off the mound like no one is arguing that so it's not necessarily, in my opinion at least, it's not necessarily about the ball weight specifically. Like if we put somebody through 20 throws, a third of them were four ounce balls, a third were five ounce balls, a third were six ounce balls, or another group just did the same max effort throws, but all five ounce balls, my argument would be the overall injury risk would be very similar. It's the fact that we're now, people are now doing maximum effort throwing programs at a much higher clip. But 
it's not something special about a five ounce baseball. It's not like the five ounce baseball is specifically like the least injurious ball weight. And then a four ounce and a six ounce ball are suddenly like massive injury risks. No, it's the fact that we're, people are doing higher, higher output programs in general and not being properly prepared for those programs. So I would argue that you're still gonna, you would still see comparable injury rates across the board if everyone was just taking a set of five ounce balls and just like ripping them as hard as they could in running throws as well. It's not suddenly that a six ounce ball, okay, is there a little bit more uh, demand from your accelerators? Is there a little bit more demand from your decelerators with a four ounce ball? Yes, but it's the fact that people are just throwing as aggressively as possible significantly more often. They're throwing harder more often. They're significantly stronger. Like you see so many guys throwing 100 miles an hour now at the big league level, which you didn't see at all 20 years ago. So that would be my argument is it's not necessarily about specifically like mitigating all stress. Like there is certain, a certain level of stress that's good. And so I think the dose is really important as well. For us, I know, I mean, we all kind of know this because we're in it, but like the volumes we use for the output days are very low. Like you'll see programs out there where it's like, two ounce to two pound pull downs three times a week. I mean, for me, when I was in college, that was, we were doing the same like holds uh, and run and gun type program that, um, but it was dozens of throws three times a week, every throwing every, I mean, I don't know who's pulled down a two, a two pound ball before, but it's not fun. Like, I don't know who came up with that. It's not fun. It's not, it's not a good idea. For us realizing like, even after we've built guys up to being able to do some output stuff, even once they're, you know, they're skeletally mature, they have a strength base, we're comfortable with their mechanics, they've been on, on, on ramp properly. It might be one to two days a week of some output throws. It might be three throws with a four ounce ball, three throws with a five ounce, three throws with a six ounce ball, and maybe another handful back with a five ounce ball. Like that's 12, that's like 12 pull downs, one to two times a week, or one day of that, and then one 30, 30 35 pitch bullpen. So the volume actually doesn't need to be crazy high. People, that's another mistake people make is they think that, oh, I need 30, 40, 50 throws, like max effort pull downs to be able to get something out of this. A lot of this benefit is patterning as we talked about, but there's really a neurological benefit to it as well, which doesn't require a crazy, crazy amount of volume. Just like in the weight room, like you do like plyometric type stuff, like you don't need like a hundred depth drops to get something out of that. You're getting, you're creating this neurological stimulus to try to, to try to get that next, like higher little bit of output. The point that you make about the, um the kind of neurological piece that it goes to. It's something that I implemented. I'm sure we've all done it in some capacity that I even preach to um, athletes is that it's going to fire not only neurologically, but like just getting your system going to throw high output. So like before start, or even if I was relieving, it's like there was some compression throws down the mound or, you know, hot, not running gun style, but definitely some shuffles to pull down into it. Not where I'm hunting the number, but like where I'm trying to turn it on of like, hey, I'm going to throw this ball hard. That way, when I get onto the mound, I'm not trying to just jamble myself up in the delivery to try to throw hard. It's like I've already built that firing system yeah. neurologically. Something that gets their arm moving a little bit faster than they would, it would otherwise be moving on the mound to, to create the activation, to create that stimulus. Like if a guy's throwing 93 on the mound and we're trying to get him to 95, like let's have him feel what 95 plus feels like in something. We don't need to give him a two ounce ball and have him throw 120 miles an hour, 115 miles an hour. But like, let's get him to feel what his arm moving 95 to 97 is, because that's his goal is to throw 95 to 97. If we, all we do is throw off the mound, throw 93, like we want to give some sort of additional stimulus beyond that. Again, you can just be five ounce balls. Like you can still use a five ounce ball, add a little bit of momentum and still get that same slightly higher threshold, slightly higher stimulus. But you can also achieve it by staying on the mound, throwing a four ounce ball. Now it's moving 95, 97, doing a little bit of a shuffle with a four ounce ball. Like you can do running guns with a six ounce ball. So there's a lot of different options. But the idea being from, a, at least from a performance and velocity standpoint, like getting them to feel from a neurological standpoint, what it's like to, to get their arm moving two, three, five miles an hour faster than what their current limit is, as opposed to just assuming that if we stay at this existing limit, we're magically gonna gain velocity. Because you have to create that adaptation on the body. Uh, if, you're, if your body only knows and your arm only knows one speed, you can't ask for it to climb and do something more. Um, so I think that that's why like all these training principles work in that aspect because you're challenging what your threshold can be to in, in turn raise your floor, what your body can handle actually on the mound as much like the weight room is if you stayed at 60 pound dumbbells outside of just like training tempo and, and you know, set and rep schemes, 
you won't actually get raise your strength base by without trying to climb it's why like even if you fail you're still creating some strength adaptation if say you're going for five reps at 100 but you only get three and then you're like struggling to get up you're still creating this adaptation on the body and the stimulus and shock and fatigue to then carry into that yeah there's a certain amount of velocity you can gain from just improving efficiency positions timing and then there's a certain amount you can gain from improving the actual like neurological output side of things it's kind of like okay you're trying to increase your bench press well we can get a certain amount there from just doing regular bench press from coaching up your form from your setup like all the things that just like get your technique perfect but then what are some additional things you can do like pin presses just lockouts like your neural you're trying to get yourself to feel what it's like to actually hold 10 20 percent more in your hands than you'd otherwise be able to, to actually do the rep and so now you're giving yourself that overload stimulus beyond what you'd otherwise be able to do so again same thing even ignoring weighted balls for a second and just saying like five ounce ball throws let's say you're not at all comfortable with weighted balls still add some sort of momentum with a five ounce baseball a leg lift curl hop a shuffle turn and burn like something like that once your on ramp properly to give you that next level of like here's what it's like to actually move your arm that fast and i would probably combo that with <clears throat> probably two like main points one being like yes if you want to have that high output day which in reality like if you can actually time it right and you let's just say you pr that next day the cns is fried right like you are like you feel like you've been hit by a truck so it's also that understanding of like what we keep going back to with like the structure of your program i remember when i was like going through the like the full schedule it was like hey let's say my pull down mountain bill whatever is on a friday i am not letting these other days mess with that you know what i mean and then on the friday it's like okay i mean i used to like tell myself every time before doing it like i'm trying to blow out like obviously you don't have to have the mentality but like i was pushing the envelope because when you are college or like indie ball whatever and you're trying to push that next envelope there is the inherent risk like you already have to accept that if you're going to be pushing your body these limits because every video like it is more stressful it just is what it is but it's like if you don't do it you're not gonna be playing anymore you know what i mean and it's like it's a very like i remember just kind of hit me like at a wall it's like if i don't figure this out it doesn't matter how quote unquote good my pitching is like they want to see this and if i don't give them this it's going to be over before i know that's the that's the fundamental disconnect between like the scared parent of a 14 year old and like the 22 year old you know college senior who's like my career is literally over right. if i don't throw two miles an hour harder and they're willing to now some of them are willing to tolerate like an excessive amount of injury risk and just don't have a plan but there is a certain level of injury risk just and we're trying to you're trying to find within that spectrum of completely irresponsible we're pulling down two ounce to two pound balls three times a week with no on ramp you're going to get hurt too i'm not even going to try throwing hard i'm just going to like cruise and like never do anything okay you throw 83 you're not going to get hurt like where can we get 99 percent of the benefit out of these tools out of these different implements while mitigating the vast majority of that unnecessary injury risk but that's the main disconnect is it's not about like 100 percent injury reduction it's about balancing injury risk unnecessary injury risk with peak performance because again you're what's the risk of your career being over in three months if you don't figure this out like that's higher risk than whatever single digit percent chance that you injure yourself going after that and you, your career is over otherwise anyway i mean i'd also even hit on like it's not easy to like get your mentality to be like that like that's like that's why i think the big word of like intent was pushed so much because like nobody thought that they could do it so it's like hey like, i have to push to this such extreme of intent but it's like in reality if you do not find your intent you're not going to be able to push your system to actually adapt to these new stresses and it's like then you same idea like what are you doing it for if you're not actually getting an adaptation for what you're doing it's just pointless you know um i think that's where it's like people get constrained like it's either like you said one or the other and it's like i have to find this but i also have to respect everything else that goes on into it and be able to extend that's why it's really nice to have a coach or somebody to talk to about it because i remember just going down rabbit holes by myself for like multiple off seasons like how do i figure this out um but it's like just finding that balance and every balance is going to be a little bit different depending on age depending upon experience let's shift gears a little bit and one of the last questions i want to talk about is the idea of like weighted ball spreads so again a little more advanced this is for someone who's maybe done some weighted ball stuff before they've done you know six weeks or eight weeks or an off season of like some pull down type stuff they've done plows for a couple of years and so they're a little bit more familiar with this they've like radar gunned pull downs um what what do the spreads tell us in terms of like how that guy how that guy's body likes to produce velocity so what i mean by spreads for people watching is like 
the difference between velocities based on ball weights. So if you pull down 95 miles an hour or turn and burn 95, it doesn't matter what, it could be throw 95 off the mound and then your four ounce ball is 98 and your six ounce ball is 92. What are these, so that would be a three mile an hour spread in each direction basically. What do the spreads tell us and how can we leverage that in terms of how we program different ball weights moving forward? I mean, I look at it from the heavier implements. Um, I know that I think in general, maybe moving away from testing in the blue ball has been maybe like the last year or two years, but there are some guys that still test the blue ball. And I know when I was playing, like we did do testing with, you know, blue, red, yellow, gray, or if you want to talk about the, the different, different, different ounce weights, um, we would move up the spectrum as we were doing those plow drills. But a big thing that I look for, especially like if you look at the blue ball throw, or if you look at the red ball throw, especially with the blue ball throw is a lot of times I know for me, when I was going to the blue ball, when my shoulder was the least healthy, I would kind of sandbag the blue ball to get to the lighter implements. Cause I was, I was good at letting the arm fly through. Like I was good at having my arm go through quickly, but my shoulder was clearly compromised because going to the blue ball, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm ripping 64s in a plyo session, clearly compensating, like not allowing myself to get to certain positions because I was compromised at the time and lighter implements don't really bring that to light as much. So you tend to sandbag that heavier weight and then get to the lighter ones where you feel good and all of a sudden you can start ripping um, and then pat yourself on the back for having a good day because you know, you hit 101 with a gray ball when in reality there's some red flags there if you know, the, that, that blue red is dragging behind pretty drastically. What else do you guys have on that? How, how would you like, how would you respond if, um, you know, a guy's heavier balls are like, he just throws the absolute crap out of them. Like he's got really high velocity. Like maybe he throws uh, a five ounce ball, 95, but he throws a six ounce ball, like 95 as well, or even 96. Like some guys will throw the heavier, like six ounce ball harder than they throw a five ounce ball. But then the underweight ball is proportionally like really terrible. How would you approach training for that guy? The guy, that, the guy that throws the heavy balls really well differently than the guy who's the opposite end. He throws the underweight balls way harder. Maybe he throws a four ounce ball like 102 and a five ounce ball 95. How do you approach those two different scenarios? The guy, who, the underweight specialist with a ton of arm speed and the overweight specialist, the, the stronger guy who typically gravitates towards those ball weights. I think even the heavier balls, it, it exposes a lot of like muscle, uh, muscling up tendencies, um, like usually kind of helps them relax a little bit more. Uh, I've noticed even with the lighter implements that um, if it's a drastic difference from like the five ounce ball, that they're usually a little bit weaker in some capacity from like a strength based aspect. So I think a lot of times too, is that these strategies and testings and methodologies, they can sort of give a coach and like yourself this perspective of something maybe underlying versus like purely like the throw itself. Um, so I think that that's like a good way to strategize where your next direction is going. Yeah, I kind of, I kind of look at it the same way as almost like a diagnostic of typically what you'd expect is about three mile an hour spreads. If you're talking about like the in one ounce increments, it's different for plyos if there's like a two or three ounce difference between ball weights. But if you're looking at like the hard leather balls, and there's a one ounce difference, like you would normally, let's say normal, like the average you'd expect is about a three mile an hour differential, which is kind of like a balanced profile. As far as like, you look at power, there's a force and there's a velocity side of the equation. Like that's, that would be a relatively like balanced profile, how they actually like produce that velocity, produce that like ball velocity. But the underweight ball is like, it's gonna be the weaker guys typically that have really quick arms, but like they don't apply, they don't have a very good like force side of that equation. And so like, again, that would be, maybe the weight room becomes an issue for them. Like we need to work on strengthening our internal rotators, our accelerators of our arm, our pec, our lat, our subscap, Terry's major. Um, maybe we focus more on the, the heavier ball weights for those guys as well, because the heavier ball weights are gonna emphasize and require a little bit more of like the force output side of that power equation, whereas the underweight balls on the inverse are gonna require more of that like relaxation, arm speed, like velocity side of that power equation. And then again, you, you just see like through going through this, like through college, through pro ball, through like coaching guys, like you see it's like the big guys throw the heavy balls really well, but they have really slow arms. And so on the opposite end, like those guys can really benefit from a little bit lighter stuff. So just like exposing and highlighting really what their weak points are and not getting sucked down that rabbit hole of like just doing what you're really good at.
Yeah, and I think that the pinnacle of weighted bowls, like the testing phase, you know, the, the going for numbers and stuff. A lot of times I've seen those guys that get on a plyo wall or they get to a plyo testing phase, net, you know, nets 10 feet in front of them, and it becomes a completely different task than throwing on the mound. And, and they start to disassociate throwing on the mound into a net with plyo balls versus throwing to a catcher or whatever that may be. And I think that a good thing for you in that situation, if, if you're a person that goes through that, then not going on the plyo wall and using the leather implements, maybe a catcher if you're only working up to six ounce or going down the four ounce, but even a nine pocket to make sure that the skill is still translating to what you do on the mound. Shifting gears, like how do you guys think through the actual like transfer of a way to, like let's say someone's watching this, they got some good tips, they're gonna go, again, kind of in the season now, but like they're planning to go through a weighted ball plan throughout the off season. How would you structure moving from that or progressing from that and actually transferring it in season? So how do we take like the gains we made from whatever weighted ball phase that we did? Let's say we're talking about the output side here. How do we take that into the season and make sure that the three, four, five mile an hour that we gained actually transfers to mound velocity and like usable mound velocity where we can actually pitch in games and get hitters out with it? I mean, for me, I would say like one big piece that I found with a lot of like athletes is when they leave or like let's say they had like a really good summer, a really good winter and they were consistent schedule, everything was like they had a routine and all of a sudden they get into these seasons and one like they might not throw for two or three weeks in like a live setting or they might not be able to like get back to that output that they were finding and be able to maintain it because we do know, especially on the speed side of things, like if you do not access it, it will just, like start to diminish, you know, so I think that's a big piece of like guys are throwing a bullpen same day like maybe even if it is a command pin with your coach okay before the command pin i will do some compressions before my throw or i will do some sort of higher output to just make sure my system is still getting that little bit of stimulus to keep me in a relatively ready state but i think that's an easy thing that like, a lot of guys do. they don't realize that they just all of a sudden they just tone everything back thinking i gotta always be ready but it's like that's true but you also have to make sure you're primed to be ready you know I um, mean, like even like potentially adding in some weight room stuff to mitigate that to a degree, yes, but like the throw is still the throw. You have to be able to mimic those speeds in season to some degree. I think that's an important point of, I mean, I, I refer to that as like an anchor. Yeah. And it doesn't, have to, it doesn't have to be like an output anchor. It can be like, oh, guy gets, guy really like had a, had a light bulb moment in the off season with like a 10 toes drill. And like, for whatever reason, that cleaned up his arm action. And that was like where he got this velocity boost. Well, let's make sure we keep that in in his routine, in his pre-game, pre-throwing routine somewhere in season as well. So that like we can feel this same thing, whatever he felt, or if it's, you know, step back drill. It, but again, it could be like a pull down, a running gun, like that was really the key for him. So whatever that key is, it would be more of a patterning key or more of an output key, like trying to keep that anchor in somewhere in season as opposed to just like completely shutting it off. And now for the next seven, eight months, like all we're focusing on is competing. And then by the end of the season, well, you're down three miles an hour and just kind of fizzled out because you didn't maintain that where it was. So I have a, yeah, I'll do the same thing with some of my guys. If, if they do have a pull down or like a shuffle anchor, yeah. two throws, two, three pull downs. Like if they're a hundred mile an hour pull down guy, like just hit a 97, like do a couple, a couple with some effort, like hit an easy 97. Okay, cool, we're ready to go. And it doesn't have to be a ton of volume. There's not a huge injury risk from doing that, but they remember what it's like to coordinate and sequence their body and get their arm actually moving that fast. Cool, now we're gonna go on the mound and, and try to set easy mid nineties at that point. Whereas like it feels super hard to them to just like jump up on the mound and go sit easy mid nineties before they've actually just like primed their arm at 97. Um, I mean, the other piece I would say is like, have you guys seen this tendency, like maybe not like here obviously, but people will go through weighted ball programs and then just like immediately jump in season and expect they're gonna be able to pitch. Like that's another kind of mistake we can cover is, I did that. <laughs> yeah, this isn't, this isn't one of those things where like you can just run weighted ball, like high output stuff, like all the way up until like a week before the season and then just sh suddenly shift gears and like throw one bullpen, two bullpens and like immediately transfer. Like, especially if we're talking about more like the shuffles, the pull downs and stuff like that, like it's not super, super specific to what we're going to be facing in games. So for me, just realizing this should have a certain place again for the certain for the right guy it, it still has like a relatively small place in the overall off-season plan one two two and a half months before the season we still need to have a plan for how to taper this into mound work how to add in hitter catcher counts lives you know live bp inner squads like there still needs to be a plan to actually taper this so another mistake is guys will run this 
run this high output stuff like way too close to the season and then it ends up detracting from their actual like mound work their actual like specific execution work and so they ended up like getting greedy they're like oh i'm gaining veloc velocity and like that six week program turns into 12 turns into 16 but they just cost themselves a month of pitch design stuff a month of command execution type stuff again there can be like a little bit of overlap between these phases but know when to kind of like do the program and know when to taper it and now actually need to shift the focus to getting ready for the season as well i mean i would really hit on that and it's just like building up into season when you have your high output days after you've gone through this six week program or whatever the case may be like there still should be an intention on like throwing a hard yes but like throwing it with it where you want to throw it you know it's like that's more like in my mind like the mental switch that you need to have like when you're getting prepared for seasons like yes like i'm not going to waste all this work that i've done but now obviously i have to get out so it's like there has to be intention like i am ripping this hard or i'm doing whatever i'm doing through the catcher making it more representative as the season goes but like you just cannot lose like for a lot of guys that edge that they find when they gain below right it's like that gives them that extra bit of confidence it's like well you don't want to all of a sudden just try to like pocket him and like try to pull him out two months later you know because usually he's like well where did he go you know i think too the athlete can leave clues in that instance of like hey what were you telling yourself within that session or within that phase it's like dude i was trying to blow it through the through the daggone net like through your face and i'm like great let's get on the mound blow it through his face let's do the same thing yeah. you know what i mean like you can match that same stimulus thought process to then you know sometimes that even mitigates and helps the command on that and is like shoot now I become the aggressor versus a reactor or a um or falling into a trap of uh the result like getting too too attached to the result right it's like oh shoot if i don't execute this ball on the middle part of the dish or excuse me the inside part of the dish then i'm going to be in trouble it's like no how about we just like see the mitt where it is throw the most convicted pitch that we can and if we execute and the guy and the guy hit it tip your cap you move on at least you know that you didn't let off the gas or like your thought process didn't shift awesome uh, one i guess one more question is what age what age should parents or athletes like reasonably be expected to to start like dipping their toe into the water of weighted ball stuff and again i know we've differentiated it, this between patterning stuff and then also like higher output stuff so i guess paul for both of those options from a patterning standpoint like what age would you be comfortable like letting someone throw more than just a five ounce baseball and then what age would you be comfortable you know doing more like the running gun type stuff again we've already talked about properly on ramps you know strength base mostly four or five six ounce balls stuff what do those different age ranges look like for you or requirements i think we can even just start from like the kid the youth level i think keeping them with normal everyday things like you know we talked about the wall ball aspect we talked about a football we talked about skipping rocks you know those things are going to organically happen every day and i think there's a point too is you can sort of see as a as a kid develops for instance like hey does this guy have a little bit more of the gene pool where he's got some athleticism and can kind of pick it up or it's like you're not trying to make them robots too early you know maybe in a you know younger novice kids aspect is that you're getting into more of the dynamic arm action patterning whether that's a freestyle right properly teaching a ten toes like getting in some of those more dynamic feels for them early but then i know we kind of touched on this you know pre is is like what's the base metric for that like where they can actually handle the stress like can you do push-ups can you do pull-ups like at a younger age and like are is your body able to actually accept and implement for instance like i wouldn't give necessarily a 12 year old a one pound ball is he actually strong enough to withhold that sustainable maybe not um so i think that there's that level of competency within it um you know is is an athlete within the session from a younger standpoint just goofing off like that's when you can also spike the injury rate of just like bad patterning etc um but even at the older age like i mentioned is that if if you're dealing with you know someone that's 30 for instance it's like just have them get the feel with something closer to a baseball before you introduce you know different weights that they've never done because that can kind of create this disbarment of trust but then see but then just like how they're actually going to achieve the goal it's like oh now all of a sudden i have a one pound ball i've been playing baseball for 28 27 years and this feels foreign let's ease that progression accordingly um that's where kind of like i view it a little bit 
One resource I think is, is helpful that people can just go and look up right now. And again, we kind of have different ways of, of managing this question internally, but uh, the arm care uh, company, the arm care like, sensor and app, like they have a velocity training checklist, so you can just go and download. That's a PDF, but but essentially like very similar recommendations as far as like if you check all these boxes, like you're probably good to go to start doing some more output stuff. Um, again, they're looking at the weighted ball stuff as as more like should you do the the output, the running guns, the pull downs, the max effort stuff. Uh, for me, from a actual just like patterning standpoint, like when is too early to go toss a football in the backyard with your dad? Yeah. Like I don't think there is an age, but if you see like a million compensations, they can't just handle the weight of the football. They can't handle the weight of you know a seven ounce baseball, or seven ounce plyo ball. Like then you know make a make an adjustment. Right. But from a just a low effort patterning standpoint, like I don't I don't necessarily see like age being a prerequisite. Yeah. It's more so like are there compensations happening in the actual throw itself? Uh, but we all I mean most parents would watch this and be like they're fine going and playing catch for five to ten minutes with a football in the backyard with their ten year old. Like that's not really the concern. The concern is the high output stuff. And so I would definitely encourage like downloading the, the velocity training checklist from Arm Care. I think that's a really good resource. They also have a sensor, which I'm just gonna plug because I, I love, I think it's a great sensor, um, but it's an app and, and an actual like sensor you can stick on your wrist and you actually can get strength measures of your shoulder. So like, is my shoulder strong enough relative to my body weight, relative to the velocity that I'm throwing to withstand these forces? And so you can test external rotation strength, internal rotation strength, scaption strength, grip strength, and it, it'll score you out and it, compared to everyone else your age, also compared to your own body weight and your own velocity and give you an idea, are there any red flags here that we need to be aware of? So that's another great resource. Again, even if you are like 16, 17, 18, like 22 years old, like you're, you are skeletally mature, you are strong. Okay, maybe you're strong in the weight room, but are you actually strong where it counts? Like we've had guys come in, put them through the assessment and you know, big league guys and they've had like shoulder problems and they grade out like 10th percentile on like an internal rotation test. I mean, that's a huge red flag. We're not gonna have that guy doing high output stuff until we get that number up where it needs to be. So looking at it also from like being able to quantify the actual strength and, and integrity of the shoulder joint of the elbow joint as well. Yeah, and I think in a perfect world too, right? W within those numbers is like, if you can get access to something like that on the deeper root side of things, then I think that would be advantageous. Um, I agree. I think, I, I, mean, I think the same thing, like I, especially with the overloader, like just the way it implements I don't think like too young. I think you can mess around. I remember, like I said, we've all done it our whole lives. I think the idea of structure with like weighted baseballs, maybe not. Um, but that's something like I've had, like in my past, I've had 10 and 12 year olds like tossing a little like red and yellow, like very low effort, just kind of getting a feel. And like, they never complained about it, ever bothering them. They felt good, they were healthy. Like saying that we still tested some other stuff too, but like as they get older or whatever, like there need there does need to be like a, a checklist for output. As far as the repad, the patterning stuff, it's like, we've been doing it our whole lives. We just now have like a set amount of balls that we use, uh, but it's like, it's the same principles that we use our whole lives. You know, you have something that can achieve a goal yeah. outside of, you know, using a football, for instance, or a different implement or a medicine yeah, ball. Like it gives them variability, yeah. you know, like let them play, right? Yeah. Like that's a big thing for young guys, like let them play without like saying, keeping some things in mind when you watch them. Like if something's so drastically bad, it's like, all right, like maybe we do a little thing. But like I know, like I've looked at this from other sports, it's like baseball is one of the few sports that a five ounce baseball is what is used from the youth level up, right? So it's like taking something where like the younger guys use a four ounce ball, use a three ounce ball to actually get a better like feel, I think has some like a lot of validity in it, you know? And that's where I find it funny with the pull down talk with younger kids. It's like, do you make outfield throws? Like, are you trying to throw someone out? Same thought process. And even if you got a guy that's like having some drawback, you just, an older age, right? Let's just say like, I came in and was giving you havoc. Like, I'm not doing pull downs. It's sort of like understanding what you're trying to train within that. But then also it's like, hey, in long toss, do you like get a shuffle and put it on a line? It's like no different. Now you're just like actually putting a number behind it. Like you're trying to sell out and test for something a higher output. So measure what you're doing. Right, it's just sort of like the, these frameworks have sort of always been there. It's just now there's like these isolated segments that you can utilize the tool. Like there's no mistake that like the outfielders have had pretty strong arms, right? And we've seen them throw from, from the warning track all the way to home plate, like on a line. And it's, when it's radar, it's 95 plus, right? Yeah, so it's like that's a, a thing that's bled by reading the game and using it as an implementation to strategize 
velocity training, proprioception, just like feel, but then also like being able to actually throw something harder than what you're than what you're currently at. I think the other thing, like for people that are just like, especially like parents or younger kids that are like, should I dip my toes into like using different ball weights? Like you'll know you're you're on the right track from a patterning standpoint if like you go through that that process and like you actually feel a lot looser, your arm feels better, you feel more athletic, you feel more in tune before you actually pick up a baseball. Yeah. Like that's the sign that you're like you're doing it right. If you're like my arm's already tired, I'm like getting achy in my bicep, my, I'm getting achy in my forearm, they're starting to complain about like shoulder soreness. Okay, the workload is probably a little bit too much or some compensation's happening or we're going too heavy with the ball weights. Like that's that's an indication from from their body that like this is this is not a stimulus that their body's loving, but it's not like you just pick up a ball and like instantly just like you feel amazing and then like next throw you just like blow out. You will feel amazing if you've got the workload, the dosage, like the patterning right. And you're gonna be like, I can't even imagine like going into catch play like where my first throw, like where I didn't warm up that way, where my arm wasn't like opened up, loose, free, easy, I feel athletic. Um, so you should be in that state if you're, doing, if you're getting the dosage on plyos right. You shouldn't be like, oh, I'm like exhausted before I even begin picking up a baseball. So again, if if this is something like that's how you dip your toes into the water. It's like, how do you feel? Are you recovering? Are you getting sore? Oh no, my arm feels amazing. Okay, well, you're not just gonna immediately blow out like two weeks later from your arm feeling amazing and properly warmed up before you get into your catch play. I would even say like one other thing like in season stuff, like I preach this to a lot of my guys too, this idea of like minimum effective dose to get what you need, yeah. right? Like there's so much more going on, probably volume wise in season, a lot of these guys like, okay, get what you need. And like you said, you should be feeling good going into your catch plays. If you are feeling taxed today, you're probably doing too much. Just tone it back a notch, see what that is. But like saying, we just like to swing to extreme of doing everything or do nothing. Like find that little middle ground to where like, I'm just getting enough of what I need each day to say, progress me through a healthy season. So then I can push again, you know, cause that's the whole goal for like a lot of us is like, get through the season, do well, like everything worked. Like, all right, now I'm trying to level up. I'm not trying to stay the same or regress, you know? I think that's why those anchors are important. They're yep. just like these sticking reminder points of what you're trying to accomplish within the delivery to help your one performance, but two output on a consistency. Like that way you don't deal with these velocity dips over time. And I think that's where the workload management comes into play with that. Awesome. You guys have anything else to add? Any other final, final tips or advice? Um, I would just say one thing, like, especially with it is parents too, especially like athletes, you know, like it is also y'all's responsibility to like be aware of some of these things. Like do not be going into this stuff blind or you're just asking for stuff to happen. Like have a baseline knowledge of what you're trying to accomplish. Same idea if it's anchor drills or anything like that, understand why you're doing it and apply it. If you do not understand what you're doing, either ask a question or figure out the why. Because if you don't know it, why, you probably shouldn't be doing it. Yeah, yeah a couple red flags too. Like if, they're, if their kid is doing it some sort of way to ball thing, like the coaching staff should be able to answer the why they should be able to give you clear answers on like what we're doing address any concerns but then also if like you're watching this class or whatever like this velocity program and like everyone in that in there is doing the exact same thing that's also a red flag because again if it's from a patterning standpoint then that should be individualized to like whatever patterning we're trying to emphasize for that guy so those drills the way that they're being coached like that should be individualized and then from an actual like output standpoint that should also be individualized like if everyone's doing the exact same prescription, exact same number of throws, exact same footwork, exact same everything. It's probably an indication that like that program is not being tailored to that specific individual. So like to me, that's a red flag. And just I try to understand, like, is this something that's specifically built out for this athlete in general? Or is this just like a quick fix program that's being blanket prescribed to everybody? And you should be able to ask those, those hard questions and get those clear answers. Or it's something I would be a little bit cautious around. Well, cool guys, appreciate the time. Hopefully people learned something from this. Um, again, we're all very accessible on social media. So, you know, DM us, tweet at us. Uh, we're happy to answer any questions about this. Um, any hot takes anyone has that, that wants to direct our way, like more than happy to have that discussion, but appreciate your guys' time and see you guys next time. Thank you.